As you know, the federal government is, uh, is dead sent against <clears throat> learning anything about cannabis, medical cannabis. Um, at the University of Mississippi, most of you probably know, uh, the federal government grows cannabis every year and, and gives it to Irv and LV and two others and to no one else. And they also uh, have held a monopoly on this growing system uh, to the extent that all of the, the information you've heard just recently from Steve and others about the various strains that they're studying, that's not happening with American cannabis. One of the researchers that is, has been trying for a long, long time to enter into that arena is our next speaker. He's from the University of Massachusetts in Amherst, a beautiful spot. His name is Professor Lyle Craker. I'd like you to welcome him, please. Well, it's a real, real pleasure to be here with you and to have such a, an attractive audience. And to, uh, first of all, I'd just like to start and say thank you to all of you who have uh, supported the effort. And I really appreciate it. Uh, and let's hope that we, in the next few years, uh, we have some progress that we can come back and report and uh, say that we've been successful. Um, what I wanted. What I wanted to talk to you today was just to give you kind of a brief history of where we've been and where we're going, uh, to give you some of the philosophy that uh, we hold at the University of Massachusetts when it comes to crops like this, uh, to give you encouragement uh, and say not be discouraged. We're hanging in there, and uh, hopefully we'll, we'll be around when the, uh, when the DEA finally gives in and says OK. Um, I've titled this Chasing the Rainbow uh, because that's what sometimes it seems like when we're we're waiting for something. It's, it's, uh, the, we have the idea of the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow, and we keep hoping that we're going to get there. Uh, speaking of pots of gold, one of the things that I've learned in working on uh, trying to uh, uh, get this license to grow some, some uh, medical marijuana uh, for research purposes is there's a lot of acronyms that are thrown out there, and I tried to put some in my pot here. And uh, trying to indicate that they're kind of, uh, you know, kind of a dark cloud sometimes that one, one gets the, the feeling of. Uh, what I want to cover today with you is uh, some of the information on the background of where we, where we are, how we've come to where we are. A little bit about science, and we've had a lot of science this morning, and I really appreciate that. Um, and something about policy and politics and how they enter into all of this. And then uh, just to, to kind of summarize up where our effort has been and how, how things are going. Um, what do we do at UMass? Well, we, we do a lot of work with uh, herbs and, and uh, medicinal plants. And as the, uh, our pre speaker just before here, we're interested in how to grow these plants and how to make them uh, uh, have the constituents that we want in the plant. Uh, the, uh, all of these plants vary in their, their uh, constituents the object of our research is to provide and get the constituents, the ratios that we want in these compounds, whether they're culinary herbs that are used on the table or if they're medicinal plants. Uh, in doing that, we grow a lot of plants in the greenhouse. We grow plants out in the field. And uh, this is just a, a greenhouse of one of the growers that's in uh, Massachusetts, which we, we work with. Um, well, I, I also thought it was interesting history. We're talking about uh, botanicals here to look at what's uh, going on in the, in the uh, uh, pharmacopoeia and formulary for uh, uh, botanicals that are used in, in, uh, are, are in, in the formulary and the uh, pharmacopoeia. And you can see that in the early, the turn of the century, as you'd expect, a lot of botanicals. Uh, as we come into the uh, age of antibiotics and vaccines, of course, that has been reduced. Uh, but there has been a little recent surge in, uh, in the end there, so that's, that's always encouraging. So we come back to uh, the, the, uh, the mythology, the tradition, and the science. And uh, uh, the, uh, uh, what there is is there's a, a dark cloud over the science. Uh, we have an uh, agency 
couple agencies probably here, uh, uh, NIDA and the DEA, who are trying to prevent us from doing the science that's necessary to bring a medical marijuana to the uh, marketplace here in America. One that we can, a, a medicine that we can uh, sell, uh, trust to be, uh, have the ingredients in the constituents of the plant that, that uh, we want to have in there for, for healthy purposes. And our objective here then in uh, working at the University of Massachusetts is try to remove that cloud so we can do the science as necessary. Uh, well, all of this comes about, of course, is that, uh, as you're well aware in this audience, that uh, a marijuana has been scheduled as, as a placed in the Schedule I drug, which means that it has no medical use. Um, and with that, uh, the position of the uh, Drug Enforcement Administration is that there's no use to do anything but eliminate the plant, uh, which they, of course, have been trying uh, desperately to do. If you look at the uh, uh, budget, has increased since 1974 when they were organized. It's increased tremendously. Um, they have uh, keep destroying more plants every year from their data that we have. But uh, I, I still see. Uh, uh, marijuana around, they haven't been very successful even with the increase in budget. Um, NIDA has control of the uh, supposedly the only legal source of marijuana that's available and that comes from the University of Mississippi uh, with uh, Dr. El Shobi down there who has a patch of marijuana. Uh, I don't know how many of you have had a chance to go down there and uh, see it. Uh, he doesn't let you get any closer than about uh, uh, half a mile, I would say, uh, <clears throat> though um, I have to confess he has some interesting stories. Uh, apparently some of the University of Mississippi students have been entrepreneurs and have found that with a, with a, uh, a fishing line they can uh, reel it over and wrap it around a plant and pull them out. And uh, he did tell me a story about uh, they used to keep a, a truck inside because it's fenced in. Uh, they used to keep a truck in there and, and would left the keys in the ignition because uh, nobody could get in there anyway. And some student or someone, they doesn't know who, uh, uh, climbed up a tree, uh, jumped down on the other side of the fence, uh, started uh, loaded up the pickup truck and uh, drove out through the fence. Uh, so things happen. And even, uh, <coughs> even the DEA uh, can't prevent some things, I guess. Um, El Shobi has, uh, has uh, his primary responsibility under contract from NIDA is to determine the level of uh, cannabinoids, uh, the, the high that people can get from illegal use of uh, marijuana, and uh, that's the primary. Uh, NIDA occasionally, as you're well aware, has supposedly made available uh, material uh, to test in a few patients, uh, but this has been uh, uh, very few. And in court testimony, uh, we certainly, uh, with uh, Judge Bittner and, and the administrative judge of the DEA, it was certainly demonstrated that this was a, a relatively uh, poor quality was, uh, was a term that was, was nicely used. Uh, there were other uh, words said, but uh, uh, we'll leave it at that. The uh, DEA, of course, is the other agency, the police agency of, of the arm of controlling the uh, um, uh, addictive drugs in the, in the United States, addictive drugs and marijuana. Um, and their mission uh, is a, uh, an enforcement agency. They are policemen. Uh, I've had, uh, uh, they've been to campus uh, several times to, uh, uh, to speak to me. Uh, they've always been courteous, mostly. <coughs> the, um, but we've had, uh, uh, we've tried to satisfy every requirement they have. Their big concern at the university is that it's going to be made available to students, um, and they've set up some, uh, some things to uh, uh, try and prevent that. Uh, if I may just use an example, not too derogatory at all, but uh, uh, they asked me where I was going to grow this uh, uh, plant if we were able to secure the license. And I took them to a room which we have some lights in, and I said, well, we'll grow it on inside here. And this room now has cement block wall all the way around it, except where the door goes in. And uh, <clears throat> they said, well, you'll have to have a 24-hour guard on the door. I said, OK, that sounds reasonable to me. Uh, they said, you'll have to have uh, cameras uh, on, the, on the door. 
I, and inside the room. I said, well, okay, that's okay with me. Um, they went through some other things and I kept saying yes. And then they said, uh, what's on the other side of the back wall there? And I said, well, it's, it's kind of an empty room, uh, nothing much in it. The electricians go in there to, uh, you know, for the power lines coming in there. And they said, well, you're going to have to put a steel barrier up there. And I said, well, yes, but why? And they said, well, somebody could rent a jackhammer and jackhammer through the wall. <laughs> now, <clears throat> I don't know about you. <clears throat> this room is only about uh, 20 feet uh, long and about uh, uh, 15 feet wide. I said to the, in all honesty, I said, won't, the, uh, won't my 24-hour guard hear the jackhammer going? <laughs> They, they, they said they, they didn't know. And then I, I, then I had to tell them, I said, you know, this is a college campus. You can probably go out on the street and buy this product less expensive than you can go rent a jackhammer. And, but you know, I, don't, I, I thought it was funny, but they didn't, they didn't think that was funny at all. Anyway. Um, uh, the DEA, even in their museum site, I thought was kind of funny. Down there in the lower right, it's very dark, but it's very dark and sinister on their site if you look at it also. It was the best picture I could get of it, um, indicating that they are a, a police agency and they're trying to uh, prevent misuse of this product. Um, well, the Food and Drug Administration, of course, is the one that uh, judges whether we're going to have a, a legal medicine or not. And they depend upon research that's being done. Uh, nothing's going to be approved unless we can do the research. And of course, that's why we're in the business we're in, trying to, uh, trying to get the license to, to grow the material. Some of you are aware that um, we've been working on this since uh, 2001 and uh, trying, to, uh, uh, trying to get this license. The, uh, the first attempt uh, was to send in an application uh, which I, uh, you know, did to the best of my ability. Um, I always confess I'm a naive country boy. I sent this off in the U.S. mail down to the uh, uh, DEA. Uh, I waited nine months. Uh, I have other things to do, right? I waited and, and I didn't get any answer. So finally I called down there and a very nice lady said, uh, we never got that application. And I said, oh, but who knows, things get lost in the mail sometimes and that. And uh, so, uh, okay, so uh, she said, fill out another application. I said, well, okay. Anyway, within two weeks, I got this uh, plain brown envelope, no return address. I opened it up and what's in there? My app original application stamped with the date the DEA got it. And so I called this very nice lady back and I said to her, um, uh, gee, I, I don't understand. It says here you, you got the application. She said, well, there were some mistakes on it. And I said, oh, okay. And she, uh, she said, you better fill out a new application. I said, I'd rather go through my original application. Uh, you know, I catch on after a while. Um, and we went through this and uh, uh, I guess, yes, I had uh, uh, checked one little box uh, incorrectly. Uh, I didn't think it was very uh, a prominent box, uh, whatever it was, but uh, uh, so we, we, we sent back the original application with the other box checked, and then uh, nothing happened. Nothing happened again. It was just, you know, what's going on here? Nothing's happened. Where are we? Where have we been? Well, let's try to summarize it up. Uh, I was first approached by the state of Massachusetts in the 1990s. Uh, they said, uh, uh, you're growing medicinal plants. I said, well, yes, we're growing medicinal plants here. We work with those and, and try to uh, produce those. We're interested in getting uh, Massachusetts farmers growing them, all that good stuff from, uh, from an agricultural college. They uh, uh, said, well, we're, we're wondering about uh, growing some uh, marijuana, medicinal marijuana. And I said, uh, uh, well, okay, sounds, sounds fine to me. Uh, but that was the first and the last I ever heard from them. Uh, I guess they, they changed, their, uh, changed their mind. And then uh, uh, being approached by uh, MAPS, um, had a few conversations with Rick Doblin. And of course, we then we uh, uh, took the uh, sending in the application, uh, uh, visited a few uh, uh, medical doctors who were in, told me more about this and how it could be a better medicine. Uh, 
Submitted the application, first application, 2001, resubmission there in 2002. I had campus visits by the DEA agents through 2002 and 2004. And then uh, 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 after I sent in the second application, I said nothing happened again. Uh, we waited here a couple, a couple of years. And then we had to take the DEA to court to make the, have them make a decision. Uh, we did that uh, uh, thanks to uh, the help of uh, uh, some attorneys. And uh, that was uh, in 2005 and 2006. So we, we got a court victory from the administrative judge in the DEA uh, in 2007 that said that yes, we should uh, be issued a license to grow this. Of course, the administrative judge can be overruled by the director of the, uh, uh, of the DEA. That has not really been done yet. Uh, they, uh, just before President Bush left office, uh, we got a, I think it was 85 or 88 pages uh, of why they were, they were rejecting the administrative judge's decision. Uh, our attorneys uh, uh, filed, said this, they, they're gonna give us two weeks to respond after looking at, uh, I don't think I could read 88 pages of legal stuff in, in, in two weeks. Um, said that, uh, uh, you know, that uh, we needed more time and that time was giving, hoping that when the Obama administration came in, there'd be a change in attitude and maybe a different uh, director of the DEA, which would give us, uh, look more favorably upon us. I do have one other uh, story to tell you about the DEA agents, if you can, this is not as, probably not as, as funny. Uh, when they, uh, when they, uh, when we first put in the license, and that's the second time for the license, then they came to visit. Uh, they wanted to meet with the uh, president of the university, the chancellor of the university, the provost of the university, the dean of my college, the dean of the graduate school, uh, my department head, and me. Uh, uh, okay, I, I could only round up the uh, uh, chancellor for the uh, research, the vice chancellor for research. Uh, he came, the dean came, and the department head came, and I came. Anyway, uh, we're, while we were waiting for the vice chancellor to appear, come the there are two, DE, two uh, Drug Enforcement Administration agents there. Uh, they were, uh, we were talking, and uh, one of them had uh, uh, played football at Amherst College, and so they were nice and friendly. And then the uh, vice chancellor came in, and they got down to business, and it was a, uh, I thought I was on TV because it was good cop, bad cop. Um, the uh, bad cop kept threatening uh, how bad this was going to be for the university. The university of Massachusetts was going to be known as a as a, some kind of uh, weird place, you know, to be to be looking at marijuana. Uh, the good cop didn't think it would be that bad, but uh, so they were trying to coerce they were trying to coerce the administration of the university to uh, reject this out of hand and not allow us. And I'm thankful to the administrators of the university. They said, no, this is research. We're very much in favor of that. And along with that, <laughs> along with that, I wanted to uh, give special thanks to MAPS uh, for leading the fight uh, for this and certainly encouraging us uh, to the uh, American Civil Liberties Union for uh, and Al Hooper for legal support, for Jenner and Block uh, uh, legal support in, in Washington, D.C. Uh, they've done a tremendous job for us. The members of Congress and senators who have signed the petition uh, for us indicating that uh, um, we should get a license. Uh, for the ill and their relatives, I feel so badly when I get, uh, and I'm sure all of you do, when they find out that you have something to do with medical marijuana, uh, I get the uh, letters, emails, uh, talking about, uh, telling me about sick children, telling me about spouses or relatives or mothers or fathers who are in severe pain and the only thing that helps is, mar is uh, medical marijuana. Where can they get it legally? Uh, and I have to tell them, it's not legal. Uh, what can I do? What do you tell them? I mean, you feel badly, people are hurting, and here's a medicine they could use uh, that they know works because they've, they've, they've going to back alleys to buy it, and that's wrong. We should have this available where uh, people can trust the source, and I need to tell them that. <laughs> <laughs>